it's the Chief Bonnie with Board Games. Who's this? Judd's on set. Judd's on set. <laughs> yeah, Greg's out of here. Not a ham tag. Yeah, we may talk about ham tag at some point, maybe on another show, but this is to focus on something totally different. France, 1944, and what's the subtitle? The Allied Crusade in Europe. All right, and something to say is I've got my old copy, and so do you. This was one of the lighter and weight only games. But let me put mine off set. This is going to be an unboxing, but Judd's name is on the box. So tell him, Judd. Tell him, how is your name on there? Um, basically, I was the developer of this. Um, when we started, I think it's 2018 is when it really started getting some traction. Mark Herman had wrote me and asked me if I had any ideas. He's had a few mechanical ideas and wrote me and asked if I had any ideas for improvement. I said, oh, yeah. No, wait. I thought you were like looking in the window watching me. Just no, saying, no, come no. on in, Judd. Come no. on in. You can help I have me to use develop. My I had to use my spider powers to crawl up and peek in his well, windows. Well, I know. I wasn't going to say, yeah. He Oops, I just gave my identity away. So. Yes. Yes, okay. right. Spider-Man over yes. here. Um, <laughs> um, no, nah, but anyways, I, I had a lot of ideas, uh, mostly involving the opening breakout. So, yeah, I sent it to him, and, and then I start playtesting it. And so he liked what I was doing and said, hey, why don't you do development? And I'm like, I don't know how to develop, and you develop with guys like Joel Toppin. <laughs> and, so, and he said, well, kind of what you're doing now is developing. So anyway, so that's how I got on board with this. But yeah, I dare say I was the biggest fan of this game at the start of this decade. Well, you're the reason I have it. So we did a ham tag episode, yeah, where you talked about how well it's solitaire, how really all the benefits of it. Go watch that ham tag episode for details, but I thought... Man, I remember this. It's top five solitaire by. It's not a solitaire game, but it was just yeah. Greg and I were doing a lot of games that we like to play solo. Yes. And so I looked on BGG. I think you even mentioned, or not BGG, but eBay. You even said it's going pretty cheap. The Back then topic. it was, but yeah. it seemed like every time I make a video, the prices have stuffed. Well, yeah, Greg killed, yeah, Greg killed W1815 <laughs> for me. Um, but you're the reason I got it. And then you told me, how long ago did you start? Like a couple, three years ago, you became involved in like bringing this thing? Well, I, I bugged Mark Herman. I, I got this back in 2011 down at Oklahoma City at their store. And it was funny when I picked it up, I looked at the back because oh, I love picture games always make great stuff. So I, you know, I flip it over and I was like, hey, great solitaire suitability, easy complexity. Well, wow, that's pretty easy for victory games. They made tough stuff. Yes. And then I was like, well, let me read what this is about. First line says designed by Mark Carmen. Like, like, okay, oh, then it turned gold. And <laughs> yeah. Like, so I started writing. So I wrote him after I played it, and he didn't know I was an obsessed weirdo. <laughs> and he just thought I was just a normal gamer. <laughs> and so uh, for those who don't know, Judd, uh, you you could say. He's your favorite designer. Yes. Okay. Um, so anyway, more <laughs> obsessed weirdos good too. Yeah, and all if you haven't seen the mini ham tag videos and all the myths and legends and and you being in his facts. home. Yeah. Your daughter. Well, my daughter did an unboxing. Yes. That was awesome. What was that one? They, um, oh, uh, Pericles. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote him back in 2011, and I was, after I played this, like this thing is awesome. And you know, he had already done for the people, and we the people got an upgrade. And I said, "Are you going to make this one again?" And he's like, "Nah." It won't ever happen. Yeah, and later on, somewhere down the road, I I made a comment about you know I'm the hope I'm this patron saint of hopeless causes. I'm waiting for the whole world to switch to the Dvorak keyboard. I'm, <laughs> and he's like, uh, you know, he's always a gentleman. Every talk to me, appreciate you looking his games, whether you like him or not. You know, he always appreciate. And he's like, well, I'm really I'm really glad you're you enjoy the game, but it, no, it's not going to happen. happen. So then we threw it in 2013, I think it was, he did that ham tag video. Mm -hmm. And it, it started getting on people's radars. I'm not saying it's all because of me, but we there was people watching it. But I don't know when John Kranz got on board. It's somewhere around there, the constant world guru. And when he got on board with wanting to do this, that's when it really happened. So, um, you know, I've had a few people ask me, well, how does that make you feel? I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, well, you've bugged him for years. Kranz gets on board, and I'm like, Hey, first of all, I just want the game oh. made. Second of all, I know my place in the universe. I'm not even Mark Herman's favorite Vance, so <laughs> I'm, I don't have that much sway with the guy. I'm Judd Vance, not the famous, not yeah. the favorite Vance. I'm not. I mean, I'm talking about my own family. You're I'm right, not his favorite right, Vance right. in my own family, so I, I, I understand I my place in this world. I think it's real <laughs> neat. Even the state of gaming that we're in in 2019 or 18 or whenever this started, now into 2020. So, because I'll hear the, and I know this is an unboxing, and uh, we may do a long version, a short version of this thing, but we want to have, when do you have someone that's names on the back of the box present for an unboxing? Yeah. Well, unless you're in Mark's house when you get to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but the idea that the, the game 
games are so board gaming, tabletop gaming is so rich right now. The fact that this even has enough of a following to be reprinted is awesomeness. Yeah. So now the cool thing is you wanted to rip this out of the shrink yesterday when it showed up at your house. Yeah, you, it's a great, but you couldn't do it because you were going to be filmed. So yeah. are you ready to rip it? Yes. <laughs> and I know what's in the box. That's the bad part. And I've seen, um, uh, my, my buddy, Oh, um, he, he made an unboxing, um, uh, I'm trying to blink. Wayne, yeah, I saw his video on it, so I've already seen what's in it. I already knew what was going to be in it. I made the Vassal module for it two years ago. So on the fly, I'm thinking, let's do this as a little bit different unboxing. Here's what I'm going to do. Let's keep us in frame. Let's rip this here. I will, in post, take close-up photos of some of the stuff as well, and I can picture and picture some of it. So we can show it this way. Mm hmm and then I can also picture in picture some of the stuff so they can see the detail. Normally I'm right up on it, mm -hmm. but when do we have a chance to have someone who has their name as game developer on the back rip the shrink? So why don't we, let's rip the shrink, get that you out sure? of the way. Because you're way more experienced at pulling cellophane off of games than I am. Sharp fingernails, that's all you need. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh. let's see how you do it. Now, see, I would normally come in and just go zip, and then now you got. Now you're, so that's why you're the expert. <laughs> I was trying to get this little piece yes, here. And right, pull that's it. That, that'll drive you crazy. But uh, see, now you got it. It's right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it was this, and now it's this, and it's a little taller. A little taller box. That's the size of the Less. old Avalon Hill box. I know this because my bookshelf. Uh -huh. I'm at home. The top row can only hold those type of boxes. This is too big for it. Got it. So. All right. And let's do. So take that top off. And you can take a look, and I can always so okay, so what does that look like just even when you first get it open? Let me pop this. So here we got a rule book. You want yours in there? Oh, I had a couple of things you didn't have in yours. That's true. Mine's unpunched. So if you want a true comparison, yours. you got the Compass Game Catalog. <laughs> okay, let me see this. The Victory Game Catalog. Okay. <laughs> I think I was looking through this last night, and the hot new game, since this is Avalon Hill also, Advanced Squad Leader. I think Empire and Arms is coming out at that time. Mobile combat clarification. So there's a little clarification in here. But this is their catalog. Yeah, it's, it's not really a errata. I didn't think it was neat, wow. but John Cranz thought it was a little confusing. So he threw it in there. So any, any questions, let, let us know on BG. So this but. is their catalog. <laughs> That's an interesting way. It's like a giant map. Okay. All right. That's not the game, I know, so let's get that out of the way. That's interesting. So, all right. So you got some errata. You got some dice. Uh, it's not really errata. He just wanted to extra clarify the point. Got it. It had to do with the train modifiers, and the train modifiers say it's only for mobile, and I think he just wanted to really emphasize that point. Um, so, or sorry, that it didn't apply to mobile. So, okay. Um, yeah, custom dice. You got two regular D6s, then you got, it looks like a mirror trash dice. And what's funny, when I was playtesting this, I was using Earth Reborn's dice. Um, it has one, uh, one, two, and three to represent some hits. Can I rip it out of there? Yeah. All right. So this is not like a little Ziploc bag. It's a cellophane pouch. So these are very nice acrylic kind of dice. Very cool. So these are hits. Um, standard Red. D6 to check your mm -hmm. morale, if you pass a morale check. And this is your standard hits, one, two, or three. Greater chance of one, obviously, much less chance of three. Um, or, sorry, I think it's equal ones, two, no, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll, anyways, take, I'll take but, a close-up shot, picture and picture it in here somewhere so you guys can see it. But yeah, it's a, um, so, yeah, there was, sorry. Um, but yeah, that's a, this is your base hits and then you're gonna make adjustments. We'll talk about that in the how to play section. Yes, rule book. Rule books. Want to compare them? Yes. Okay. Um, this one is much lighter. I think this is, uh, so I think I counted up one time. It's like, oh, there it is. 20 pages of rules, but I think wow. like really about 12 of it are actually rules. This is 24 pages. Yeah, and it has its own playbook. Um, when it comes to this, Mark Kerman let me write this thing. Um, so something I had learned is based, based on an old engineering phrase about you can have a cheap writer now pick two because you can't have all three. Um, it's something Mike Rinella told me about writing rules. He said, clear, clear, concise, comprehensive. Pick two. If you think about it, you might need to pause the video. Clear, com concise, comprehensive. You cannot do all three. I went for clear and comprehensive. I wasn't mm -hmm. going for concise because the goal isn't, it's not a speed reading. How fast can I read these rules and be done? It's you want to know how to play the game. 
And I tried to set it up because one thing that really annoys me on rules is topical rules. A great example is Struggle for the Galactic Empire. That thing drove me crazy. I'm playing a solo game. I want to follow the sequence. Step A, read the rule. Step B, read the rule and play it while I'm going. Mm -hmm. Very easy to find. Mm -hmm. Purpose of a rule book is first to teach you how to play it. Second, when you play it a year right. and a half later and you forgot 10% of the rules and you're trying to remember one that you can find it easily. Only 10%? Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like it. Your skills are better than mine. I'm like, I forgot 90% of the rules. Dude, I was dead on ambush when I tried it because I wanted you there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, uh, so if it's a sequence of play, it's much easier to find stuff. So I set out to go to, right down the sequence and then to thoroughly explain them. And when you're popping back into a rule book a year and a half later and you're reading something and there's some concept in it that was mentioned earlier, you need to find it. And yes. it, So I, I probably over-reference rules saying, go back to here. Just in case you ever go back and pop only into one paragraph. Oh, now, what was that? Zone of control? <laughs> well, you know, okay, yeah. But... It's right there for you it, for that. I also have this big thing against acronyms. Any of you designers out there, hear me and hear me well. Um, don't assume people know your acronyms. Only if it's something you know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Your zone audience, of control. Zone of control. I think the only two I use in here is HQ and ZOC. Yep. Now, there's one reference where I'm doing this paragraph on an example and I talk about movement points and it gets really obnoxious writing that word over and over and over. So at the very beginning I put MP. five movement points and in print I put MP and then okay it spins three MP, two MP, one MP. But if you have any questions right there in the paragraph then I did the same thing later. See, so please quit the acronyms on stuff that people don't that okay you created this cool new idea stop it. I, I was playing a, um, a East Front game and at the end, it made this reference. I was pretty sure it was a port city down by Sevastopol, but I couldn't understand. And I dug through that rule book for like 30 minutes to find out that in one paragraph is made a reference. Like, dude, if you're mentioning it twice, stop <laughs> it. You're not getting paid by how many letters you can save. Teach the game. So, anyways, yeah, under I, I was guilty of over explaining. And nationality, you call it an A H A N R. I made that up. Oh, I just said that was faking that you made it. So, all right, <laughs> um, very cool. So, anyways, if anything, I tried to over-explain it just to get it. Because if you don't get it, first you're gonna have a negative impression or search all over for it, or you're gonna be on BGG asking the questions. So, so try to. Uh, so, if the rule book's bigger, that's why it's not a detailed game. It's just an inside really baseball question again, since you're here. Okay. So let me see the rule book here. Did you did so? How much of this was ported over? Were you just converting? Well, there was the no book? electronic copy of that, right? So I could have just I mean, copy and paste this, and edit it. How much of this were you like, or did Mark say this doesn't change, this doesn't change, oh, this uh, changed? Yeah, the core rules are the same. He added um, the combat system changed. We'll get into that, and um, he added some new Chrome pieces, um, V1 sites, um, the Brittany campaign. There, there's a special rule section in the back that talk about that, but. Um, now, I did use a lot of the ideas. This one starts with like a beginning and then this big example of play. It's kind of bizarre right in the middle of it. I wish I'd put it at the end. Even mm -hmm. back when I was playing, I thought that. But um, Bob Ryer was, if you ever picked up victory games in Civil War, Vietnam, any of these games with these big, heavy complexities, when you start reading the rules, Gulf Strike, I think it's a masterpiece. Um, they're really not that hard to grasp. And Mark had told me once that it's because of Bob Ryer. If you ever see that picture of like, it's like, the 1927 the Yankees team. of game designers mm -hmm. and it's the old victory games. He's there and I was wondering, who is that guy? Yeah, he's the reason their rule books were beyond, I mean, beyond everybody else's. So, um, so yeah, I was kind of following his lead a little bit, but it's now, hard to top, top one of those. Obviously no playbook, but you said there was a, like a play explanation in there. Does uh, yeah. the playbook take that idea? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a uh, comprehensive example of play right in the book. So we did that in here. That was the main purpose. Okay, it has the scenarios in it. All, f all the scenarios start at the exact same place, exact same setup, the end of difference. One's the fall of France, um, market garden, breaching the Rhine, and going, going all the way, basically. Um, breaching the Rhine was what the basic game was, the original game was about. But we went with detailed uh, setups. The graphics, none of that was me. That I think I was Ken Dingley. Uh, it was it was like when I saw him back, it's like whoa! I'd send him vassal screenshots, and then he'd do all the magic. So all that beautiful stuff is that that wasn't me. Um, 
But yeah, we did give really detailed examples of the combat and how the mobile combat works. Because the idea is if you're reading this and you still, I'm not sure I get this, follow along with it. The one thing I want to point out, sorry, 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 Mia Culpa, there's one section in there where I do a combat and said the Allies took three hits and the Germans took one. They took four. That's been asked on the message board. I had switched up how I wanted the result and Game, did not switch to this different game's section of the broken. matrix. Ah! Game's broken now. So anyways, if you see that, <laughs> boom. But otherwise, we gave really real detailed examples so you can follow right along. And so I want to, I want to be really clear, no questions on how to play this game. Uh, so one of the things I love is big pictures and then explanations that show exactly what you're looking at. And like you've even got highlighted counters. What's this? Oh, red? the red. Oh, the red line. Just a uh, you, you can't cross that border. That's right on the map. Got it. But oh, yeah, okay, if you so can see it, um, I'll, I'll take a photo. Yeah, like when he's showing how this how the marker moves, he highlights. Like, oh, that's so cool. Um, so that's yeah, they sweet. Compass just did a killer job with this. <laughs> All right, what's next? All righty, um, the original game. I probably need to show this just to okay. explain this part of it. Yes. Um, had these tables down the side. It showed your um, an, uh, your increment charts, your combat tables, your reinforcement schedules. German side's here. Now, a lot has changed between now and back in 1986. A lot of us know it's a lot harder to find people to play war games. So a lot more of us play solitaire. One of the things that annoyed me and call it laziness. I'd set this up, and when I wanted to look at something for the German side, now the combat table was the same, I'd have to get up, walk around the other side, because I'm old, I'm old and grouchy. It comes comes with the age. I've earned it. Anyways, so it's, and if you set it sideways to try to get both of them, you're cricking your neck, and you can't see the cities upright. It wasn't designed with a solitaire in mind. The biggest contribution I did, the mechanic stuff's all Mark Kerman. The difference is in this, that's all Mark Kerman. There's one rule in here that's mine, and I'm like, yee! Um, but um, anyway, the um, the biggest contribution I had outside of I was trying to, you know, he'd, he'd kick out train modifiers. I'd try them out, tell them the results, and is this what you're looking for, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, my biggest contribution to the game was the solitaire aspect, because I play almost everything solitaire, and I want it here. And I don't want to reach really far. I want it. And so a lot of times you'll have this guy's track and this guy's track of supply points, whatever. I put them on the same track. I bet a lot of people do this. You put both markers down on the same track and you try to keep, you're trying to keep your footprint small so it's all right there. So a lot of the stuff I had done had to do with keeping this footprint small. Now the new game doesn't have all the tracks on the map. That wasn't because I said, hey, we need this for solitaire. You'll see, it's because this game, the future plans of what's going to go with this, you don't have room. Your table won't be big enough to do all that. Future plans. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. But so anyways, so what comes with this, instead of being on the map itself, you got your reinforcement chart. Tells you right there, and I love these kinds. If, I mean, if you want them. What I tend to do is I just look at these. I put them on the turn track themselves. So turn two, you see this big stack of units, mm -hmm. Germans and the Allies. And then I just reference this card. I yep. just have it stuck over to the side of the table. But if you have room because you're playing two-player, you can put pieces right on here. They match right up, and it tells you right where to put them. And it even has, like, Engl it says in England, rule 3.12. I put that. Because one of the things that bugs me is people just assume you know the game like they do. No, nah, if you look at this... If there's a rule reference, you should have it. You shouldn't have to go digging for stuff. I, my goal is to keep you, once you've learned the rule book, to keep you out of it. I hate reference and rules. I don't say I speak for everybody, but I bet there's a large contingency who doesn't want to go back in that rule book. Um, they did an interesting, I know we're not at the counters yet, but since he's represent the counters, the way they show a bit of that German flag was yeah. just like a little arm of maybe a symbol that nobody's allowed to even show Yeah, well, can you don't even say it or though. I know. YouTube will get I you. Know. Um, okay. The, oh, the other is the setup, and actually, I had made the rough draft of it, and they made it look cool. Um, but yeah, I, I, this is how sad I am. Paint Shop Pro 1997, that's what I use. <laughs> yeah, back when Bill Clinton was president, I never upgraded. I mean, I still use that thing for my graphics, but yeah, I'd take my Vassal screenshot, blah, blah, stick it in here, and stick it on a white screen, and then send it off, and they'd make it look cool. But um, anyways, there's the setup, and then... Um, they also in the playbook because you know John Kranz is telling me, hey, a lot of guys like this. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. Different different strokes, different folks. Um, 
it tells you, they give you the, uh, nah, I can't find one either. The cool, shows the map. And like arrows with the bubble shows you the unit, so you know, oh, right here, I don't have to look up hex 0715. It shows me hex, you know. Nice. So he gave you two different ways to set it up. Very cool. So you can literally see both ways to do a scenario. Yeah. A lot of the scenarios are, well, yeah, even the blowouts that are kind of cool to show you the area. Mm -hmm. Like that's Cherbourg right there. Or yep. I say it wrong. Cherbourg? Don't ask me how to say French words. I'm sure I said it wrong. Oh, cool. I know I know Lee. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't spell I it. I think though. mercy it's something, but yeah. bon appetit. Merci. That's like all the things I know how to say in French. Okay, um, this here, I was telling you about, this stuff was all incorporated on the game board. Um, now it's a player card, um, and it's set to the side. If you're playing two players, you each have your own. If you're playing solitaire, my original thought was for the solitaire players, one for Germans, one for allies, flip it over, you have a solitaire. Mm. Um, Mark Mahaffey, he he's a real, he has a lot of great graphic ideas. Um, he um, he said, why not combine them? So you have all your information right here. It tells you, and I love these because I hate going. Like I said, I want to stay out of rule books. Mm -hmm. uh, Victory Point games. I like a lot of their old offerings. Uh, yeah, they're still around, I think, just under a different name. But I always hated going the setup. Put this marker on this track. It's all right here. Here's where you started for the Germans. Here's where you started for the Allies. This is the maximum amount that the Germans could ever have, which you'll find out when you play. You'll never exceed it anyways. But um, it's all right here. How to, I mean, all your pieces set right up. Your reinforcement schedules. Um, I'm sorry, that's on the other card. But... Uh, it tells you how many supply points each side gets, replacement point. Oh, sorry, reaction points. Um, it's all, but it's all right here. So when you're playing solitaire, you only need one card, and you can keep everybody's track. So it keeps your footprint small. Two players, not a problem. You sit across from each other, you get your own. So it's a duplicate. But that was what I saw. I was like, man, that's why he's a graphics dude, and I'm not. Especially when I'm using 1997 programs. Well, you're a traditionalist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is your basic player aid, your terrain effects chart, and it tells you, and this was on the old board, it um, tells you which headquarters can activate which units. British, for, I mean, for example, Americans cannot, a headquarter cannot activate a British unit. Um, so it tells you, helps you straighten that out if you need to, and it gives you, during the supply section, how to do attrition. Mm. The back of it, this looks really complicated. It does. You know what it reminded me of? It looks I'm... like the box art before it's wrapped around a box is what it looks to me. Because okay. when they'll print them out uh -huh. and say, this is the folds. What does it look like to you? That's exactly it. I never could put my finger on uh -huh. it. Okay. Um, yeah, the original one Mark Herman sent me was like a Word file with just, you know, four sections. Hmm. But um, And this was another Mahaffey thing that he'd come up with, how to combine two different charts into one. It looks complicated. Don't be scared. When you try it, it's real easy. Follow along with the example of play. He just took two charts and put them into one. And um, the um, it's it's a really clever system, but there's four combat results. Um, I fail my morale. You fail your morale. We both pass more. Sorry. We both fail morale tests. We both pass it. One of us fails, and the other guy doesn't, or vice versa. So you have four combat results. And it tells you right here, if you're doing a set-piece combat, meaning everybody's starting right adjacent mm. to each other, or mobile combat, because each turn is broken into increments. So it's representing the tanks, the armor on the run, catching them on a move, on a continually moving battle. Um, that's where the armor really shines. If you start mobile, you start here. It has little arrows, it tells you, and then it says... Um, Here's what the defender does to check his numbers, the attacker, and do this, do this, do this. Now roll the dice, oh, and, and then find which one applied. So all the gray on the bottom is if you're in a mobile combat. Yes. All the black on the top is if you're in a set piece. And each of the four battle results are split gray and black for the mobile That's results. It. Okay? And then it tells you, failed attack, successful for the attacker. The successful defense or failed defense, meaning you pass your morale check, you just cross-reference, go to the box, and follow what it says. Hmm. So it looks, but it reminded me of Pacific War when you uh, when you would do the search. You know, you're searching, for, and it, it looks really complicated. It's like, well, this is really, really cool. Um, yeah. So it's 50-50 all the way through. Boom, are you attack defense? Are you mobile? Are you set piece? Are you in repulse, standoff, retreat, or stalemate? And then you're either looking at the top black, or, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's got a nice. I'll have a shot in here 
the white on the black and then the black on the gray. That is cool. And that's why I have the air in the playbook was because I started on one of these sections and then I said, oh, I want the other guy to fail. I want the allies to fail their morale roll too to demonstrate something. But I had mem I had seen... I was still down in this section when I was calculating losses and missed. Yeah, the allies take an extra one. So, uh, mea culpa. Sorry, sorry. Wait, we're talking about the broken part of the game? Mm, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, the poor explanation by the jabroni who did the playbook. <laughs> the jabroni. I'm just teasing. Just teasing. By the way, I need to get this out there so everybody knows. because I, I get this all the time when I call Mark Herman great one, and they always say, well, Gretzky, Gretzky, Gretzky. Oh. I'm not a hockey fan. I know who he is. I mean, duh. He can't really live around here without that knowing. That shows that he's good. Yes, but... Gretzky's the great one. I always referred to Mark Herman as great one, and I actually got that from The Rock. Yeah, I'm a hillbilly that, you know, 20 years ago, I used to watch some wrestling, but, and he always, oh, we want to go one-on-one -on -one with the great one. So, <laughs> so I started doing it because I always thought it was funny when he did it. So when people always say Gretzky, I'm like, no, actually, it's from The Rock. Um, <laughs> so. Let me uh, check. I want to. All right. What is that? What ah, play rate? This I have never actually seen before. Ooh. I probably should have because I did get PDS of everything. I'm sure I've seen this. It's just, okay. I haven't actually looked at the, I signed off on the stuff like a year ago. But that's right out of the rule yeah. book too, showing what. Yeah, it's just part. a quick, and yes. this is cool because like I said, stay out of the rule book if you can. Yep. Um, it's just a summary of the term procedure and most of it's spent in the drawing the chits. Yeah. So. Um, and the sample combat unit. Yeah. So, and that's nice because. I always hated digging for something. What really annoys me is when you have to go like to the first two pages to find out what some term means in the yes. game. And it'll be in the section with the pieces. Because every time I read a rule book, I generally skip this stuff. Because when I'm sitting there in bed reading at 11 o'clock, I'm not going to remember what all these numbers mean until I actually play the game. Yeah. And then it's that way that's out in front of you. Yeah. And you know that the set piece combat strengths, the right hand number. Off yeah, just in stuff. case you, what's S yeah. and what's the S mean for this? Well, boom, it tells you right there. So you keep this by your table if you need it for reference. Chances are you play this game by the. After the first mm. turn, you can be putting it up. So reduced strength is when the counters, it's flipped or whatever, and yeah. then it's like got a shading on, the, on yeah. the side to show you that it's reduced? Yeah, I like that better than the red bar also. That is cool. Also, probably something with colorblind, red, mm. green. Um, uh -huh. Mark Kerman actually takes a big thing. He did that and started that in Pericles, really taking huh. that Ooh. on this. Ooh. Sorry. Okay. That looks cool. Now. Um, what is that? This is the blow-up map. Um uh, for a second. I don't think it opens. It looks like it's yeah. just a board, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, there it is. I knew it was in there somewhere. How to set the game up for people who don't want to use the card and look up hex, blah, blah, blah. It tells you right what to do. That's a s just set up on cardstock? Yeah. Wow. But here's the thing. The first thing when Mark Herman asked me if I had any ideas, I said, the opening breakout of this game is a nightmare. And the reason why, you've got these stacks of units. You can stack four units in a hex. And if they're green units, you've got these little green markers you put on top. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you can have these big stacks, but you don't have them in the opening breakout. But stacks of four. And when you activate, you don't activate everybody. You don't activate all the Americans or the British. You activate a headquarter. And then that tells you you can do three armor, five infantry. And you pick which ones you want to activate that turn. Hmm. There was no way to activate, you know, you could turn them 90 degrees if you wanted to, but so maybe in this hex of four, three of the units are activated. In this, of these three units, two are attacking this hex, one's attacking this hex, because you're not required to do what you do in a lot of war games. Everybody must act as one okay. combined. Good. It's a nightmare, and that's the only reason why this game wasn't hitting my table regularly. I hated that thing. Now, here's the thing. Now I can do this thing in my sleep. I've done this so many times. I know exactly what to do and what the numbers are, and blah, blah, blah. But war gamers, I've heard this phrase, um, a mile wide, an inch deep. They love to gather games, play games, play them once or twice, and move on. So if you have a frustrating experience off the get-go, you don't really want to revisit it. So that was the whole thing, was trying to make this as easy as possible. All right, we're back in. We had a little cut. We'd gone long enough that it cut off, so we're going to try to pick up inch, no, a mile wide, inch deep with their collection, and then you were explaining. Yeah, they, yeah, they, play, it, they play it once or twice and may, may move on to the new shiny toy. I've been guilty of it. A lot of times I want to try a game out and then come back a year later. Oh, yeah, that was a fun one. I want to play that Explorer. But, you know, only a handful of games I have really done deep dives, Washington's War Hands and the Sea, stuff like that. I went and played them lots and lots and lots. Um, so, anyways, if you're playing, um, 
If you're playing the first few times, especially with the old one, you'll find out that opening breakout is very frustrating. Um, because you have, that's where your stacks are really intense. You got these stacks, you can put four units, four counters in a hex, four combat units, I should say. And um, you got, they're all bunched right up next to each other because they're trying to break out of Normandy. And when you activate a headquarters, it's not, oh, I'm going to do an American headquarters so all American units move. No, it tells you, you know, three armor, five infantry, you pick units you want to activate. And then um, from there, you got to figure out, okay, well, you're not activating everybody in a hex. There's a stack of four you may activate, only three of them. So you got to know which three you activated. And then two of them are going to attack this hex. One of them's going to attack this hex. And you got to stack. And you're sitting there trying to calculate combat factors, and you've got your tweezers, or if you're doing it without tweezers, especially frustrating because you're knocking stacks over. <laughs> so I said, you know, I enjoy the game, but I enjoy it a lot more when the breakout was done. And I wish there was a scenario where it's like, turn two, breakout's done. Because once you've done it, it spreads out and it's a lot easier. But I said, dude, you got, and I don't call him a great one, dude. You call him like, dude. No. <laughs> His epicness. Hey, dude. No. But I was like, you got to gotta make these hexes bigger. And I'm thinking, you got to have them where you can fit four units in a hex. And I was thinking Operation Dauntless. I'd worked with Mark Mazicki on that on the Vassal module. And you can fit four. But these counters are a little bigger um, than the old game. And when you look at the size of the map, if you had tried to increase it, that much, you, your table ain't big enough. You're gonna be like them dudes in the movies where you got this giant table and all the generals around are sliding to pieces. And Okay, you don't want that either. So the reason Mark Kerman is Mark Kerman because he thinks at a higher level than all us mirror And his mom named him that. Yes, <laughs> that, that's <laughs> a good point. Although, you know, from the ham tag videos, he's been known as many names through oh, history. You'll have to watch yeah, all those videos that to that see him. That's true, that's true. Tease him <laughs> with ham tag stuff. There you go. Um, anyway. He said, do this, just the opening breakout. And once you're past this point, it's spread out. So that's what this is. It's a hard mounted piece. The back, like I said, oh, it's cool. I noticed this in between the break when mm -hmm. we were doing this. It's kind of um, transparent type where you can see the unit and what's behind it. Mm -hmm. But that's what this is for, just to help you. Now, I've played this game enough. I don't need to put them on here. I can put them on the regular board. I know immediately who's attacking who and what the numbers are because I've played it enough. Mm. But like I said, a lot of players play once or twice and move on. And this is to help your initial experience, to give you a positive experience and say, yeah, this is really cool. This is easy to handle. And the breakout's key. I mean, that's the whole yeah. problem was they're bottled up in this small area and they've got to fight through mm -hmm. and break out. So, and, and to toot my own horn on the Vassal module, um, you do not, I do have the board on there, a little button you hit to click it. And I have a button at the beginning that says either set them up on the main board or set them up on this board. But uh, if you're on this board, when it comes time to move them, you don't have to drag and drop because anything that annoys you on Vassal, I promise you, I'm 10 times more annoyed because I make the modules and I don't think you should have to do that. You hit a button, it transfers all the pieces or you can right click and transfer stacks of them. I bet you that was yes. easy. Oh, it was, it was a bear. <laughs> Coding. Yeah, it was, I mean, it, if you're in a vassal, dig into my dig into what I did in the background. You'll now see. Now let's compare counters real quick. Yeah. So just an overall, I've got I bought first. this off Hamtag, and I do have these. They're in the uh, they're in a little. Uh, Hundred and thirty counters. Yes. Hundred and thirty. Yes. Oh, I've right got there. it upside down. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Wow. One hundred thirty pieces. Yes. Yeah. Man. Okay. Um. Anyway, uh, this is what we got now. Yeah. Now, the raw number of combat units, there's only, this actually has one less combat unit. There was a British Armor Brigade. See, all this game, the armor units are divisions, the infantry are corps. And um, anyway, the um, so there was one brigade, and it had special rules, and it was kind of a little fiddly, and Mark Herman said it was just, it's, it's more effort than it's worth. He took that unit out. Otherwise... Same number of headquarters, same number of combat units. So why do we have more counters? And we'll get close-ups so you can see how much better looking these things are. All right, I'm zoomed in um, just on these counters again. And you'll notice there's some counters from the original that are on there. And let me zoom in just a little tighter to show you the counter set on the left. All right. And then, if Judd, if you want to just point okay. out like uh, some of the counters. Yeah, um, 
you can see I put this, these are right next to each other. This is the same. This is the old game and the new game. Um, these are half inch counters. These I believe are five eighths. For those who clip counters or you're shrieking, yes, I don't clip them. I'm sorry. I'm just not something I do. I'm not that dedicated. But um, the new ones are rounded, which I, I do like the look of a clip counter. I just don't want to put in the effort. Okay, the um, you can see the, okay, that's a British red. And the old one, it's Canadian, was that yellowish color. Now it's green, a little easier to see. French is blue. Um, but, and the Americans had that greenish clear. Now they're kind of a dark color, so you can see. Also, any doubts, it says, uh, you, see the where it said 23rd, now it says 23rd US. So whether it's color-based or has the words on it, you always know who it is. On the headquarters, they just got the flags. When you punch them out, you're not going to see the rest of the flag. It's just a little, it actually is kind of a little artsy cool thing when he added it. Because originally they just looked, they didn't have it on there. Then he added it. I thought, that's kind of neat. And I didn't even see this rest of this stuff. I could just tell from the piece that it was just a piece of the flag of the country. And, but you see the size? That's that's your strongest German infantry unit. There's 21st Panzer. Can we swing back this way? When, when I was talking about counter clutter... This was a unit that starts off green, and on it had on the setup for the reinforcement chart, it had like an asterisk to tell you to put it on there, some, some note that it was a green unit. You actually had to take this piece, and I love this. This is so nostalgic, the off-centered counters. I haven't seen those in a long time. Task, task Force games, they were the worst about off-centered half-and-halves, but uh, you had to put this on here. So if you had all these units down here are the units that would start off green. So what, seven of them? Um, so you had to put this on here, and it was counter cluttered. Then when they lost their green status, you'd pull it off. Um, what we did in the new one, because we had um, we had more counters to more counter space to use. That's the same unit. That's when it's green. There's that's all it's saying. It has one morale. Well, there's your one morale. It has an asterisk on there to remind you it's a green unit. I mean that number stands out, but there's an asterisk to remind you it's a green. And then when it loses green status, you just swap the counter, so you don't have all this extra clutter. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's the, you can tell the color scheme and um, to tell which country it is and really went out of his way. Mahaffey did a real good job on this to show, to help clarify whose units are whose in case you have any doubt. It's because, okay, we got, we got room to play with and he said, fill them up, man. Cause uh, some, there's a, like one out of a hundred guys or so who like to make their own counters, but let's fill it up and do it with cool stuff. So we did mnemonic counters. Because I hate going to rule books. If it's on the board, I'd rather have it there. I hate counter clutter. An example of counter clutter, and it's a great game, don't get me wrong. Any of the games I've played in the great campaigns of the American Civil War, the old SPI, you have the unit, and then underneath you got a marker for how much damage he's taken. I hate that kind of stuff where you have to put stacks of counters to tell what one unit is. Um, but don't get me wrong, that's a great series. Um, so... I hate counter clothes. The stuff that annoys me is trying to remove from this game. Um, one example is, um, and I'll show it when you do the close-ups, the Americans sent a lot of green units into Europe at that time. And you would put a marker on that says green, and the morale would be one. Now, when they met certain conditions in combat, taking losses, making the enemy retreat or something, you'd pull that counter off. You got a stack of four green combat units. You've got a. You can do it two ways. You can either put one green and say I'm supposed to remember that every unit's green, or I can put eight counters in there, or however you want to do it. It's a mess. We had counters. So for those uh, seven infantry units, there's two counters. One for the green, and then when they lose their status, flip it and change it to the other one. So uh, very. So clearing up counter clutter from that stuff. Um, the bridgehead, the original game, the purpose is to get so many bridgeheads across, and that's one of the scenarios in this game, is to breach the Rhine with so many um, bridgehead markers. Well, it clutters it up. And if you've played D-Day at Omaha Beach, if you remember, if you've played that game, you clear mine hexes out, and you can either clutter it up with one per hex that you cleared, or if you've done a stretch of five, they had arrows and you could flip them sideways, and everything between here is cleared. Same thing with the bridgehead markers in here. They have arrows, so you can say everything between these two points, or you can ha have many bridgehead markers going on. Mm -hmm. um, also, let's see here. Um, and plenty of cadre. It wasn't just, oh, we need something cadre. I was actually, I'm so OCD about these kind of things. I had spreadsheets out, and I was counting. Okay, I need this many um, activation counters. I, I don't know if we got that in there. 
Mm. I'll talk about. Okay, I, I okay. I need this many of this. I need this many of this. And so then I was trying. I was always juggling. So, um, but there are plenty. You're not going to run out of cadre. When I say cadre, these units are three steps. There's one side, the reduced side, and then if you take a third hit, you put the cadre marker on. Oh, counter clutter. Now you really don't want all these units with a single cadre. That's and it's a lot easier to spot them because you need to spot those units easily because they have no zone of control. Um, but there's plenty for that. Also, the um, mnemonic counters. Um, reaction points. It's a very important part of this game. The um, When you cross the Rhine River, Germany's reaction points every turn go to zero. There's a schedule on there, but it goes to zero. The marker, it says, you know, reaction points for the German, and then you flip it over for zero, and it says Rhine crossed. If you, and then also, because crossing the Rhine affects German reinforcements, the turn marker flips to, to um, say, Rhine crossed. The Allies have many possibilities. Their schedule shows you the base amount, and it's not much, so you're going to need to get more. And the way you do that, you got to go clear uh, Saint Nazaire and Brest. I hope that's how you say it. And I hope you don't get demonetized. Medical term. Medical term. We'll say, yeah. If you get those two spots, it's supposed to represent the Brittany campaign. You'll get two extra reaction points. So the marker has. And, oh, sorry. There's there's five V1 sites in this. And um, if you can clear those out, you get three. So the allies could be at their base number, bonus of zero, bonus of two, bonus of three, or bonus of five. So there are two reaction um, track markers, and they're double-sided. One says R equals zero, R plus two, R plus three, R plus five. So when you see the base number, you don't have to, because, you know, it's easy to forget those rules. And, oh, man, I really could have used I've been missing out on all these reaction points. Now, when you slide the mark, oh, hey, yeah, I don't get one. I get six because I have a plus five on there. It's all stuff to help you play the game easier without having to consult the rules, memorize stuff. It's, oh, yeah, it's right there in my face. But you love digging in rule books. No, I don't. <laughs> I want to read them and be done with them. Uh, the backside, half shaded for reduced. I like that. I don't know if it was because putting a red line through it, colorblind, green, red. I don't I don't know. I like it. It's real easy to tell. Uh, the activation markers. It, I'm either repeating myself or no, one no, or the video. No, we didn't get to this at all. Okay. Um, I was talking about this map. Mm -hmm. And you have four... He uh, I'll even show this because there's units. There's four units. And I want... Three of these guys activated. To help you remember, this is, if you want to use it, it's just there to help you. You can slide, okay, when you activate the headquarters and it says you can do three armor and five infantry, there are counters with, let's say, activation, activated with an infantry and armor symbols. And there's enough to handle exactly what the most you'll ever need. And you just put them right on there. And these are the units I'm going to activate. Now, as to who's attacking which hex, the backside has an arrow. So you can just point it, this guy's attacking this hex. Then after they attack in their increment, these guys over here need to attack in the same increment. But, oh, hey, the football game's on. I want to go watch it. I don't want to miss any of it, but I'll probably forget when I come back. You just flip them over off their arrowed side, and that just means they've already gone for this increment. So you can come back in a moment and pick up. If you got to go to dinner or whatever, you, um, it's all there to help you manage the game easier. There are hit markers on here. That was just something I come up with when I was playtesting the game. Since the pieces were the same, um, I was using my old game with the new combat tables and stuff. And um, so, anyways, what I'm doing, I'm I'm rolling up the and the damage. The damage is different, but I'm having to try to memorize, m keep two sides in my mind. So, okay, my base roll. I have two hits on the ally side, two step losses, and three on the Germans, and then I'm going to have to adjust this for force ratios and support and terrain and things like this. So I'm trying to juggle all this math in my head. So I just so I come up with this. They say one hit and two hit, and there's like five of each. You just throw it down there. Okay, there's two hits, there's three hits. Okay, now I can go over to this side. Okay, he adds one for the force ratio. He's at three. Okay, reduces one for the... And then you're all done. Okay, two and three. If, you, if you're having a problem juggling the numbers, it's there. I got to the point where I really didn't have problems, but it's just if you want the option. There are, um, I said there's bridgehead markers. Um, that's when you're going across the Rhine and there's not a natural bridge there. There are bridge hexes on the map. Um, and the first time the Allies move in adjacent, the Germans are going to make a roll to see if they blow the bridge or not. So then you got to keep track of how you're going to do that. Um, well, that's not that tough. Um, there's blown bridge markers, but where it got difficult was some of these hexes had two or three bridges, and there's two of them. Um, you can watch how bad I am at French. 
uh, Cologne and Mon Man Hay Mon Hay. Perfect. Something like that. Okay. Man Hay. <laughs> uh, anyway, the um, those two have multiple. So when you're in there, it's like, well, which bridge? If I put a blown bridge, you can't tell. Is that one bridge or three bridges? So this is just a counter you can put there. If there's a question mark, it means it hasn't been tried. You haven't made the roll. If there's an X on the bridge, it's blown out. And if it shows the bridge symbol, that means they failed their roll. So every possibility is there and it's on this marker so you don't have to sit there and clutter it up or try to make notes or whatever so we try to do as much as possible to make it easier just by looking at the board staying out of rule books having not having to write notes or remember lots of stuff there's plenty to remember in games already especially your first time out are we looking at the map yes let's do it Kind of, you can hold her up here. Okay. So, boom, huge. Look at that. Can't even see you. Yeah. Now, if I hold up the raw size of these, you're going to say there's not a lot of difference, but I'll show you what there really is. This is the old map. So, the new one's a little bigger and it is mounted. But look at the plane surface. See how half of this map is taken up with tracks? Let me. Okay, this side's easy because I can just fold it behind. This side I'm not going to go against the crease, so I'm just going to show you relative size. This is, uh, let's get my bearing straight. Okay, there. This is the same area approximately, a little more in Germany, but there. That's the size of the old map against the new map for plane surface. There you go. That's how much bigger the thing is. Part of it is the hexes are bigger because the counters are bigger. The biggest part is there's just a lot more in Germany. Part of it is the original game. Better color scheme, I think, too. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. The, um, okay, the original game was one scenario. You're trying to cross the Rhine, and the number of bridge hexes you get across it are the, um, the level of victory you achieve or fail. Okay? This new one has four scenarios. They all start at the same setup and end at different places. The first is just the liberation of Paris. It's just a short introductory. It's not a tournament scenario. It's just try it out, get familiar with the mechanics so you're not way into this and realize, well, I really screwed up two, three hours ago, two hours ago on this. And, uh, you know, who, who likes to go back and restart games like that? Um, the next one is Market Garden. The third one is the original scenario, trying to breach the reach the Rhine. The fourth one is going out the conquest of Germany. So he's added this. Added more markers. I forgot to mention that. I'm not going to say their name because it might be demonetization time, but it's they're, they were the bottom of the barrel, the old men and the young boys. And there are rules for how to, that that once you breach the Rhine. Grenadier? Um, no? I, uh, I'm not saying the word. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's just, gotcha. All right. It's not a cuss word. It's just one of those YouTube eh, words. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, Anyways, they, um, there are rules about when they come in, and so he added these to it. But also the other part, why the map's this way, is there's another game coming out called Russia 1944. I think we're going to start work on it here in a couple mm. of months. And it's, it's the Soviets against the Germans, and there's an option to put both of these games together. And if you're familiar, 1975, I think it's called Battle for Germany, SPI Jim Dunnigan. Brilliant idea. I've, I've never seen anything better than this idea for how to handle these type of games. You would have the Soviets and you would control the Germans on this map. I would control the Western allies and I control the Germans on that map. So I'm not gonna slide guys over or you're not going to slide guys over because you're helping my cause, mm. and we're racing to we're racing for the middle. Um, so if you get this, you got a game. You got that, you got a game. You put them together, you're getting three games and two. Mm. So the maps are set up to, and I've seen it before. When I first got the copy of the map, um, Mark Mahaffey sent me both both maps. Um, so, um, anyways, as for this map, uh, it has more terrain features on it, uh, more different types of terrain. Um, it shows you down the side what it is, and there's you can look in the map to see what the train modifiers are. Um, and okay, the um, also a neat thing up here. I mentioned this. I think I did. I don't know if we got in the cutoff. Okay. In yeah, and this has um, a track for how to track the air units. You can't bring in strategic bombers and tactical on the same increment. Um, 
And then you only use the bombers twice. And it had a track. And track is like wasted space for something that you're only going to use twice. So it's right here. Instead, we put two bomber counters. When you're done with it, throw it in the box, you're done with it. Real easy to remember. When you make the roll to see if you have air power, if you don't, you flip them over their unavailable sides. Um, and then it tells you right here the rules about how, how you can or can't use them. Um, so you don't have to dig in the rule book. And, you know, we had this space up here. We weren't using them. Like, hey, they were already stationed out of England. Let's use them. Um, and then you got your spot for the 18th Airborne Corps for um, Market Garden and Plunder Varsity. Um, comment on, okay, I love the map. I had seen this thing on the Vassal. It was wider, as I seem to remember. Um, so I like this light, lightish green color to show the open terrain. Um, so I'm totally digging it. And if you've seen Star Trek First Contact, when they're touching the missiles, like, ooh, I'm touching the map that I've seen electronically. Okay. Uh, what, art's completely subjective. Uh, I've read, I read comic books for most of my life. I've argued McFarlane, Didco, Ramita, uh, Sal Scheme, all those guys. Everybody's got their preferences. So it's really what you like. What they're what's trying to show, because um, Maria's mentioned this, somebody from France, she was kind of upset about that it looked like there wasn't a whole lot of stuff in France and the French countryside is beautiful. And what this is trying to depict is if you're in this area, you get a train advantage and you're looking for that as the Germans. It's not saying that this is Western Kansas, and I'm not dogging Western Kansas, it's home. I love it. You're born here, you're raised here, you get used to it, there's a comfort to being able to see forever and be able to count the trees. One, two, three, four, okay? You can see 20 miles away the lights of a city, stuff like that. Um, not in the sky, you see the lights, okay? That's not what it's trying to show France. It's just saying the beautiful French countryside is represented by these colors, but there's no particular train advantage that's gonna help you when the armor's chasing you and doing an ongoing fight. How you choose to interpret that, whether you want it light green or brown, is up to you. I like the light green. This is a little intense, so mm. I kind of like if it's not, if it's not particularly going to help me, I'd rather not have it blind me. I agree. It's very, it's visually pleasing to the eye. Yes, it's gentle. I don't know how to really explain it, but yeah, you know. Um, so you got you got a whole lot more terrain on here. Love the map, bigger map, and this is cool. We've just had it sitting here. Yeah. It's laying flat. Yep. I get most of my games with mounted boards annoy me because. They do this number on me. So I'm trying to put books, or I just set it down. I've kind of learned, just lay it down, put heavy books on it, go read the rules, mm. and come back two days later or something. But I really like to play games while I'm just setting down, put the pieces down, start pushing around, read the rule book while I'm going. So that stuff annoys me, and I was like, I almost prefer, if you're going to make a mountain map like that, I'd prefer a paper map and a piece of plexiglass, because what's the point? Mm. Um, so I love what Compass did. One of the best mounted boards I've ever seen. Yeah, they did a very good job. Yeah, at least I mean Avalon Hill used to have those where it just poof, laid yep. flat right out of the box. And but it's this the is exact really same thickness, kind of. Yeah, I mean again, this is the blow up of that area right there. Yeah, this represents mm -hmm. that. And like I said, you can fit four four counters in each. Uh, Something I was going to talk about on the map, just to save anybody trouble, it's on the message board also on BGG. Um, the, there's red supply spaces and white supply spaces. Nothing special. They all have the supply rules you can read about. The red was just supposed to show you there was something special. Over here, St. Nazir and Breast uh -oh, um, are the... Um, the yeah, medical term. Um, that's the Norman... I mean, the Brittany rules. Um, Antwerp gets you, some, if there's something special about that because the allies get it, there's, they get a bonus supply point. Um, this here, Cherbourg, I hope I said that right, and there's two others. They could, they should either all be the red or all be white. There's nothing special about Cherbourg. All it represents, and this kind of goes without saying, if you're the allies and you run off here and you don't do anything with the Brittany campaign, and this guy runs up here and hits your supply, everybody's out of supply. Germans could just go in and get your yeah. supply. You supply. instantly lose the game. Yeah. So that's what that is. There's nothing special about Cherbourg. Just kind of a reminder, but you probably know this. And if you play with any type of competency, you're not going to let that happen. And the Germans but, sure as heck ain't going to fight. I don't care how good they are at the dice. They're not fighting through that and taking those spots. Um, but the one, Rotterdam, there's nothing special about Rotterdam. That, that shouldn't it's red. There's nothing. There's no rules about getting Rotterdam. So just wanted to point that out to save you some time if you get curious in the rule book. Broken. No. 
<laughs> but anyway, so it's that somebody asked that question on the board. Um, so that's what that's what that's about. So cool. hopefully that clears it up. All right, I think we're looking good. What I'm going to do is pull out. I'll do some very close up. Well, I'm going to do a quick unboxing where I'll just boom, 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 boom. And then I think you're even going to pull out some counters while I'm up over top and kind of show how the counters look mm -hmm. different. But we'll make that one quicker. So, uh, well, at this point, if you've watched this whole thing, um, maybe you don't even want to see the fast one because I've thrown some photos up here. Um, any last, let's see, before we got, we got a few minutes before this uh, cycle out on our uh, frame here. Anything else you want to add? Just the joy, maybe? Did you have a lot of... It's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, I'm compensating. I mean, your, your name's on the box, but you're not getting paid. This, this is my payment. I always said I don't do reviews. A game. I don't take free games for reviews. Um, I'm a hipster or something like that, or I just don't really want to learn a lot of new games. If I'm that interested, I'll buy it myself. This one, this, this is free because it wasn't to review it. It was because of the development work on it. I'm not making any money off of this. That's all Compass, and I don't know if Mark Herman's getting paid per box, but I am not, so I'm not here to promote to help my own special interest. <laughs> I just wanted to see this game made. Well, well, they know you were a fan of this yeah. back in the day. I dare say I was the biggest fan of I that. I would agree. Um, so, um, and so if you think, yeah, you're, you're biased, you're a biased shill. Well, I, gave the, game, I gave the game, yeah. yeah. Well, well I, you played I, the Vassal. Yeah. I played it in playtesting plenty. Right. But now, I mean, I gave the game a 10 when it was that. Yes. I put it on Hamtag as my favorite game to play solitaire. Uh, by the way, if you're upset about that, <laughs> go out to my profile, Air Judd and A-I-R-J-U-D-D-E-N. I've got a thing, a link on there. I have made a list of the top 25 pure solitaire pure. only games. Pure. I have played a zillion of them since then, and almost all of them are war games. So, um, it, so that, but anyways, it was my okay. favorite to sit there because back then I was doing so much Vassal playing, I wasn't playing as focused on solitaire. Now, as most of the playtesting you did was Vassal mode, or I know you said you were using the old map and playtesting. Or yeah, originally I just used the map. Okay. Um, Small right in the counters and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But once I got the pieces and I got the Vassal module set up, I ran it through there. Because, you know, Vassal gave me the advantage of hit and save and coming back later. Yeah. Because yeah. it was the middle of softball season sure. and I was coaching five well, nights zero, a week. Zero setup time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, anyway, so yeah, um, let's see. I think we're good. Anything else? No. I okay. think we're good. Um, like I said, I'll come in and shoot a tight, fast one. Bought okay. with board games. Jeff Vance, 1944. <laughs> See ya.